Good day everyone, another cold December day here and uh, a dog in the background apparently and we're back with the Range Rover and the Range Rover is due a service oil and filters, nothing particularly special but I wanted to film the procedure this time so I can show it to you to get the opportunity to point out various details which are important when servicing this kind of car. Range Rover Sport and uh, Discovery 4 with the TDV6 or SDV6 engines. As it stands right now, the car is 9 years and 2 months old and it currently has... One thousand and one five hundred thirty two kilometers, which is about sixty three thousand four four hundred and fifty miles. If I got it right, if not, I do apologize. Now, I'm servicing this car with new oil and filters every ten thousand kilometers flat. Well, give or take a few hundred, but definitely not longer than that. That's a policy that I'm applying to all cars. And uh, pretty soon, in a couple of weeks, I should be filming a service for the Kia and uh, for the Oppo. So stick around. And let's go through the components one by one, because I want to go into a bit more detail. So, this is the pollen filter or the cabin filter. It's made by MUN, and my opinion is that it's probably the best you can get because it has certain very interesting properties it filters dust uh, bacteria uh, i think it also has active carbon and most importantly it filters the small diesel particulates pm 10 and pm 2.5 and from what i dug around the internet this is pretty much to my knowledge the only filter that, that does this uh, on the range rover it's the third time I'm using it and it's been very good and I've also used it on the Kia a while back because my dad was complaining uh, of uh, issues with the air in the cabin and last time I checked with him uh, he said that the issues were uh, much reduced so this has pretty much proven to be a very good filter and no reason to change it moving on this is the air filter this time I went with an OEM filter because I wanted, I was curious to see, well, who manufactures it. And surprise, surprise, if you look down here, it's again made by MUN. And this will be very interesting because I want to keep this in mind because in the next service, after hopefully another eventless 10,000 kilometers, I want to buy an aftermarket MUN filter and check to see if they have the same serial number. This would be really interesting, right? Because an aftermarket MUN filter is like a third of the price of this OEM one. Moving on. For the oil filter, again I went with OEM this time. And let's see who makes this one. I don't think you should be surprised anymore, this is again made by MUN. Right. So I'll try OEM. The car so far has been serviced with uh, only OEM components and I will do an experiment next time as I said to see if aftermarket parts by the same manufacturer will make any kind of difference besides price. Now let me talk a bit about the oil that I'll be using. Now previously I've serviced the car with a authorized uh, Land Rover service and they've always used this type, Castrol Edge Professional Turbo Diesel, Fluid Titanium, blah, blah, blah. What's important is the viscosity, 5W30, and the ACEA, A-C-E-A specification, which is C1. Now, this is important, because if you take a look at the manual, it says engine oil for V6 diesel vehicle should be 5W30, perfect, meeting... This is a Ford requirement, WSS M2C934B. If unavailable, oil meeting specification, a CSC2. Now it says here C2, but this is C1. Is that a problem? Well, no. Because the only difference in the definitions of a CSC1 and C2 
is that C1 has a lower percentage of ash, which is very desirable if your car has a diesel particulate filter, which this car does. And this, this particular type of oil has been used in the last four services, I think, and I've had no issues with it, no oil, oil consumption, absolutely no problem whatsoever. But I'm using this one this time again because I had some leftover from the previous service and I wanted to use it all up. Next time, I want to switch to something else. I found a oil from Ravenol and you know I uh, ended up liking that brand quite a lot. They don't sponsor me or anything. I just tested it and realized that it is pretty good. So I'll be switching to Ravenol next time, which has pretty much the same technical specs as the Castro. And by the way, I actually plan on making a video comparing the two and the filters on the next service. But never mind that. It has the same technical specs of, about Castro, and the main difference is you can actually purchase that one uh, directly yourself. Now, Castro Ledge, the professional variant, is not something that you can, at least here in Romania, I wasn't able to buy this from some uh, parts store. You have Castro Ledge, but not professional. Why? Because the professional variant is only available with uh, dealers and... Uh, uh, garages so I bought this one from the place where I was servicing it and um, as I said before I want to use it one more time because it's proven to be pretty good and well as you know Castrol tends to be the brand that is uh, falsified uh, the most uh, like counterfeit oils and stuff and there's really no easy way to verify if this is genuine or not. I trust that this particular lot is genuine because I bought it from the uh, from that place where I was servicing the car and they've been pretty honest and I have no reason to doubt that this is okay. But with Ravenol, you can always check yourself. So anyways, enough about that. Let's get to work. One thing we will not be doing today is changing the diesel filter. Funny enough, apparently the manual says that you should change the fuel filter for diesel once every 10 years. Personally, I think that's absurd. Uh, but also, it, the diesel filter doesn't necessarily need to be changed every single time with every single service. In our case, for this Range Rover, the diesel filter was changed 10,000 kilometers ago. So most likely I will do it next time and I'll make a dedicated film about that filter in particular when it is due. And let's begin with the easiest task, which is the cabin filter. Now with the box for the FP2747, you get the filter itself, nicely packaged, and additional documentation that tells you in detail what you should do. The process is fairly simple, but it's nice that they thought about providing um, detailed steps to make your life easier. Now, if uh, if I understand correctly, the actual pictures, by the way, they look look more like uh, the interior of a older Discovery, but it doesn't really matter because the system is pretty much the same. Now, how you go about doing it? Well, you open the glove compartment. This is obviously a left-hand drive car, so the glove compartment is on the right, the bottom one, you open the bottom one, and you now have to open it all the way. And the way to do this is you have this clamp here and its counterpart here, and you have to squeeze them and then pull on the glove compartment down, all the way down, to reveal the fuse box, the ventilator for the cabin and the location of the cabin filter, which is that part up top. Now, removing the old uh, cabin filter is straightforward. You have this tab over here, you push on it with your finger, you pull towards you and you can take this out and there is the old filter. What's very important to take into account when removing this is you'll see that it has a certain direction in which you must must place it. 
if you open this first tab, you see there are some details. So the old one was also a Freshest Plus C model. This is important, airflow. So we have to install the new one such that air, the airflow points downwards just like here. So just grab the old filter, pull, it comes out fairly easily. And just for fun, let's compare the old with the new. You see how dirty the, uh, the old one is. This actually has about 15,000 kilometers. The new one is obviously much cleaner. And on the other side, they look pretty much identical because obviously the bottom side is the cleaner part, which is facing towards the interior of the cabin. And installation is the opposite of removal. You take the new filter, you identify the side with the airflow direction, which is this, just as before, and it should slide into place with relative ease all the way like that it's slightly more difficult with one hand but nothing terribly difficult so we have the same airflow which is perfect you push it all the way and then at some point you should be able to raise it one or two centimeters to the top that's how you know that it's all the way in now why it's important to actually push the filter a bit upwards when you install it is because the plastic uh, mask has these bottom tabs that go underneath the filter to keep it pressed upwards and if you don't push the filter up a little bit yourself you might actually have difficulty installing the installing the mask and with very little effort you push the tab first on the left side double check that the filter is a little bit up and then you just have to slide the tab all the way back to its original position until it clicks like that after the filter is installed and this clicked all you have to do is put the glove compartment back you just need to push it from the bottom and it will automatically align the two side tabs to the correct position you'll hear a click as well like that and it's all back to its original position and you are done with the cabin filter. The next task is to change the intake engine air filter. And for that, we start by popping the hood. The latch is somewhere around here and the strut should normally support the hood. This is the location of the air filter. Taking a look at the ducts that go away from it, the way this thing is set up is like this. For the diesel engines, the intake is, is uh, this side vent here. Air goes in through here, goes all the way like this, and goes from the bottom to the top of the air filter box. It gets filtered obviously and then because this is this is an sdv6 engine meaning it's the three liter uh twin turbo or bi-turbo engine you have two emerging air ducts this one goes to the uh right hand side turbo as i'm looking at the engine and the second air duct goes to the left hand side turbo with the air filter box, you have seven Phillips screws. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. You unscrew them all the way. Don't worry, you can't lose them because they're actually held in place by the cover of the filter. And do note that once all of them have been unscrewed, you can remove the cap but not by too much because of the air ducts you don't really need to disconnect these because you because i'll show you you can actually install the filter with the limited amount of space that you have but just note that there is a small inconvenience there are three things you need to do to change the air filter number one obviously remove the old one 
lift this as much as you can. Take the old filter out, noting its orientation. That's important. You might struggle a bit here, but it is absolutely doable. Taking a look at the state of the filter, this has 10,000 kilometers on board. It's not terribly dirty, but it's not really expensive to change, so might as well change it. The second task is to take a look at the air filter box and see if it has any dirt, leaves, any kind of items at the bottom. Now, in our case, it doesn't, it looks pretty good. But if you find that you do have stuff in there, you grab a vacuum cleaner and you suck up all the dirt from the bottom. Now, this isn't mandatory per se, because whatever it is in there can't go up because of the filter, but it's something that's nice to do. And obviously the third thing is to install the new filter. And it's obviously just as tricky to put the new filter in as it was taking the old one out. But ultimately it is doable. It slides in. Double check to make sure that it's seated properly. The gasket should be flush with the box. So take some time to make sure that all corners are properly seated. And when you're like this, see, now it's aligned. And when you're happy with the result, put the cover back on and tighten all screws. There's no torque requirement for this, but obviously because there are metal screws on plastic, don't over tighten them, you risk uh, damaging the plastic cover. Okay, we're done with the air filter, now onwards to the oil and oil filter. In order to access the oil filter, you first need to take off this nice looking plastic cap and in order to do that you need to remove the oil cap and this is one of those times when the actual height of the car is proving to be an inconvenience i, I had to put myself up on a chair <laughs> in order to reach it but before you remove the oil cap it's nice to just clean around a bit to make sure there's no dust, dirt, or any contaminants that are going to fall in. You don't really want that. Okay. With that done, untwist the oil cap like this until you can remove it. Remove it, take a look at it. In our case, it looks good. If, for example, if we would have had something like uh, a cappuccino kind of fluid, uh, that would have meant that somewhere, somehow, oil is mixing with coolant, but thankfully, in this case, everything seems okay. And now the plastic cap should just be removed by pulling it from underneath. It's held in place in three spots, though you might struggle a bit. Let's see if I get... so that's one, two... Something like that, and then you just need to take it out and lo and behold there is the oil filter box and for now if you want you can put the cap back on just to make sure nothing falls inside we'll take it out again when we're adding oil and regarding oil for this particular kind of car there are at least three different ways of draining the oil from the engine the easiest one is to have some kind of uh, vacuum pump. You open this cap here, you connect that pump here, and it literally drains it out in like 15, 20 minutes. This is the method that they use where I previously serviced the car. It's the most convenient because you don't have to go underneath the car, but because most of us, myself included, don't have that kind of device, we will have to go underneath the car and take the heavy metal shield out. And underneath the car, you're greeted with 
quite a lot of bolts which are most of the time rusted and possibly even over tightened by whoever touched them last even though they should theoretically be torqued to like something like 50 newton meters ain't nobody got time for that uh, i've already slackened them up a bit to make life a bit easier and you have two at the front one two three four on this side and the same on the other side these are all 13 mil and once you break them loose i actually had to use a breaker bar once you break them loose they come out quite easily the only ones that are ever so slightly different are this one and the one on the other side which also have a nut at the top that's a 15 mil and you have to hold the nut in place as you unscrew see something like this and the last two at the bottom those over there which are very very long and have some long washers on the other side make sure to keep track of which bolt goes where once the bolts are out the shield comes down do note that it is a bit heavy i don't know 10 plus kilos oh it's not really a danger if you're underneath it but be aware that it does have some weight okay i'll remove the bolts take the shield out and come back to you when i'm done and in case you're wondering what's with the jack stands i swapped my wheels for winter ones and uh, let me tell you i genuinely truly hate the lug nuts on this car and obviously i'm not the only one from what i've seen i'll have to buy new ones because the existing ones have swollen up due to rust and it took me a good amount of time to take all of them out think an hour an hour and a half but anyways enough about that moving on we got the underbody shield off so we're ready to drain the oil but before that let us tackle the oil filter now it's important to do this first because you want to have some way of allowing air inside the engine to make draining the oil easier and you can do that either by removing the oil cap or by unscrewing and uh, removing the oil filter housing so let's see this should normally not be overly tight because it's plastic but in any case you need a 32 mil uh, hex to open it I'm underneath the engine now and I want to show you the other two methods that can be used to drain the oil. One of them is the classical one, just use the standard drain plug that you see right here. It's certainly easy to do, but it has one, I would say, big inconvenience. When the oil starts gushing out from here, What's it, what it's going to do is it's going to hit this cross member and instead of having a clean flow, it's going to splash all over the place. You can check out other YouTube videos with uh, people draining the oil like this and they have all kinds of ways. Either they let it splash or they use something like a cardboard placed like this so the oil hits the cardboard and then down in whatever it is it's supposed to drain into. But either way you go, this method is rather messy. For this particular engine, however, there is a third way, which I think is very easy and very elegant. And it all has to do with this small little pipe here. You see it's at the same level or actually even lower than the drain plug. And this one you can just pull out by pushing on this tab and pulling it to the side. This is the method that I've learned from the place where I was servicing the car. And it's very easy to do and as a matter of fact i'm going to do it right now and uh, as far as i know this method doesn't really splash and you're literally just supposed to press this little clip and jolt it a bit until it gets to one side and any second now 
Yep, there it is. See, all clean and smooth. It's gonna take some time to drain, but we're not really in a rush. Just let the oil drain, put this to one side, and we'll come back once all the oil has drained. And after about 15 to 20 minutes, you can see that the oil is barely dripping, which means that we've drained the oil from the engine. So now all we have to do is connect the tube back and you know it's connected when you hear a firm click like this and that is it no gaskets no bolts no stress and if you're here might as well clean everything up because that's always nice with some brake cleaner and then wipe everything off until there is no more oil. Now, normally, as a side note, at this point, I would also take a look at various other points underneath the car to see if there's anything amiss. But in our case, the things seem to be looking uh, fairly all right. Cool. Now it's time to add fresh oil. Had you chosen to drain the oil using the standard drain bolt that I mentioned here, after the oil has drained, normally you should have bought a new bolt, that's what the manual says, and you would need to torque it to 23 Newton meters. But in our case we will skip this because we obviously didn't use it. At this point it's gotten a bit dark, but uh, I don't want to leave the car without oil over the night we'll tackle the filter the oil filter tomorrow but it's safe at this point to add fresh oil i'm gonna add five liters for now the system should take about six but i'm gonna add five install the new filter tomorrow and uh, then top up as necessary until the oil indicator tells us that uh, we're at the right level. And I have to say, to me at least, this is always the most satisfying part. Just grab a nice funnel. I obviously have removed the oil cap, put the funnel in the uh, oil tube and just pour. Don't pour uh, very fast to make sure you don't uh, spill over the, uh, whatchamacallit, honestly, I'm not sure how this thing is called, a funnel, right? Anyways, it doesn't matter. That's one liter in, four more to go. And I will see you all tomorrow. And here we are the next day. I've taken the oil filter out. Taking a look inside, we see that uh, there was no oil overfill, even though the previous day we had actually filled the car with new oil and that's because all the oil had had time to drain in the oil pan so you can take the filter out even after you've put in new oil that's no problem as long as the car has been standing still for a while okay let's move on to changing the filter and here is the oil filter along with the oil filter cap, plastic. At this point, grab the filter and pull it out. It may take a bit of effort, but it comes out eventually. Okay, I pulled on it and it came out, just like so. Now, the filter you can discard and ideally recycle, but before you do that, it's best to take a look between the fins to see if there's anything suspicious that would indicate a problem. Stuff like metal shavings and whatnot. In our case, everything looks just normal. So there's no problem that we can see. Right, so we discard this. And also you have to discard this rubber O-ring that you see here. 
As far as I know, all new filters always come with new O-rings and you must, you absolutely must replace the old O-ring when changing the oil filter. Now, you can use a screwdriver to pry underneath it and pull it out, but because this is plastic, I like to be, I'd say, extra safe and just use something like this, with, which is an interior trim tool, and just shove it underneath like so and pull the o-ring out and discard this one as well now at this point feel free to use some brake cleaner to clean up the surface of the cap as well as the insides of old oil and discard whatever it is have inside and with the cap cleaned, it is time to put the new filter and o-ring. With regards to the installation, start with the new o-ring. Always use some fresh oil to lubricate the surface of the o-ring. Don't ever install rubber o-rings dry. I have a bit of new oil left over. I just, with the finger, just gently lubricate the entire surface. When putting the new o-ring in, don't use any tools, just with your hands, it's supposed to be fairly tight. You might struggle a bit, but the fact that it's lubricated should help. There you go. And when it does reach its seating position, which is here, give it a good look and make sure it's not twisted anywhere. As you can see, in our case, it's not. It's looking good. Finally, you grab the new filter. As you can see, both sides look the same, so it doesn't really matter which way you install it. Just make sure you install it so that at the end it is flush, uh, parallel, I mean, with the surface of the cap. Okay. Push it a bit and it should eventually click. That's it. New oil filters in o-rings lubricated we have to put it back one thing i want to mention uh, well two things actually first of all i will re-emphasize always remove the old o-ring put the new one in never ever do a double seal and with regards to the filter pay extra attention because i have heard of cases where the filter was installed improperly and it did lead to engine oil starvation which is pretty bad Okay, enough about that. Time to install this thing back in the car. When you install the new filter, always start twisting it by hand. Never use power tools or anything else because you want to be able to tell if you're cross-threading it. So, it won't fall. Just gently squeeze it back into its original position. Start twisting it by hand until you can no longer twist it with ease, like this. And finally, the cap needs to be torqued down to 28 Newton meters. That's it. And with the filter changed, we're supposed to start the engine to make sure that everything works fine and there are no leaks. But before that, there are two things that you need to check. Number one, the manual says you need to wait at least five minutes before you've added new oil to give it a chance to drain to the oil pan. That's okay in our case because I put the oil yesterday, so no problem there. And you are also supposed to make sure that the current oil level is at least above minimum. For that, 
go into the settings menu and scroll all the way down to service menu and check oil level display. And here's something interesting. Yesterday we've added about 5.3 liters, so well below the 6 liter limit. But even so, it says that we're near the top. Why is that? Well, simple, because the oil filter element is currently not filled. After we start the engine, you'll see that this level is going to drop. So let's get ready to start the engine. And now I want to draw your attention to one aspect, which is specific to these kinds of engines, namely the TDV6, SDV6 engine, or Ford Lion Series V6s, or AGD V6s, whichever you want to call them. Now they have a pe peculiarity regarding cold starts, in that you'll often hear them tick for two or three seconds, and then they go quiet. Now that is because of the way the oil system is designed. It takes a couple of seconds for the oil to reach all the way up to the camshaft area. Now right now, because we have just changed the oil filter and the that region is empty, it's going to take a good number of seconds more. The idea is don't worry about it as long as it is within a reasonable region, like no more than 10 seconds, it should be fine. So here it goes. So you heard the tick. It went off after about five or six seconds. And now we're just gonna let the engine run for a couple of minutes to make sure everything is fine. That is to check for leaks wherever we worked previously. So underneath the car, near the oil filter and on the oil plug. And let's see, underneath the car, all is well, nothing is dripping. So here, all, everything is fine. We've stopped the engine and now we need to check the oil level again. As you probably know, this 3 liter engine doesn't have a normal dipstick. As you've seen before, you can only check the level through the car's computer. But if we now go to the oil level display, it's going to say not available. Why? Because you need to wait at least 10 minutes after you shut the car down for this to give an accurate reading. But there's a catch. There is something you can do. The manual says you should just hit the cruise control cancel button twice within two seconds. So one, two. And the oil level indicator is now showing whatever it is, is reading at this moment. And you see the level did go down and it's telling us we need to add about half a liter. Okay. As I said earlier, this is because the oil filter housing now is full of oil. So this is normal, we're, gonna, we're going to add the requested half a liter and then we need to do one more thing, which is to tell the computer of the car that we've done a service because there's no way for it to automatically do that on its own. And in order to reset the service interval, we have our Vident tool connected to the OBD port, which is down there. Obviously, the exact commands differ from unit to unit. For this one, we pick Land Rover. Land Rover Automatic Selection. Hit OK. It finds our car. We go to Hot Function. And the very first one is oil reset. And just hit service interval reset. Okay, we hit 
OK. Ignition is switched on. We hit OK. Ah, apparently you have to hit another OK. Please wait. Completed. Set the ignition switch to off. It's off. Hit OK. Ignition switch to on. Hit OK again. Vehicle status OK. Test complete. We are checking the instrument cluster. No indication of the service light. So we hit OK again. Ignition off, OK, ignition on, and now it's asking me if I want to do a complete diagnostic, I do. I will check the codes, reset any historic errors, but I won't film this because it's not really necessary. What is important is, if you don't have one of these, you can either go to your local Land Rover service and they will charge you quite little to do just a reset. In my case, for example, the cost of a reset at their place is about, I think about 15 euros, so not much. If you don't want to do that, you can just drive normally. The car is absolutely fine. But what happens is if you don't reset it and the internal counter is going to reach something like 30,000 kilometers, even though you actually did service it, it will complain on the dashboard and ask you to do a service. This has nothing to do with the service itself, just the fact that the computer doesn't know that you serviced it. But anyways, this is a, let's say, a minor detail. And don't forget to install the good-looking engine plastic cover. When putting it in, this is an indication of alignment, so the two need to be aligned, and then it should click. Let's see if I get it right. One, two, three, four. Now with that done, put the engine oil cap back on. Make sure it's properly tight. Everything looks good. The underbody shield is installed. Now the manual asks that all bolts are torqued to 62 Newton meters. Honestly, from experience, this is too high because they tend to rust over time and it's going to take much more than 62 Newton meters to take them off. I normally just torque them to about 50 Newton meters, which is absolutely fine. And with that said, the service is complete. Let's move on to the conclusions. And I'll end by touching on three points. Number one, as you've seen, it's not at all complicated to service a Range Rover Sport on your own. In fact, it's just about the same set of steps that uh, you do for any car. You just need to be careful at what components you use, and I recommend you either go OEM or the best quality uh, aftermarket parts that you can find. Number two, do not forget to recycle the old oil. Now I've put everything that I got out of the car, about 5.4 liters, into these bottles and I'll take them out for recycling, um, as well as the filters and especially the oil filter. The, the oil definitely should not be thrown away on the ground, in the sink, whatever, because it is highly toxic. And number three, as always, costs. I quoted, I got a quote from the service where I used to service the car, and they asked for about 285 euros for a full service. Now with the OEM parts, with the OEM oil, and everything that you've seen in this film, I spent only 145. So just a little bit over half, which is, a very good deal in my honest experience, considering, as I said, that this procedure is not terribly complicated. 
And with that, thank you very much for watching and I will see you next time.